Two and a Half Admins, episode 216. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. And it's been a while, but you've got some plugs, Alan. The first one, Halloween webinar, ZFS Horror Stories. Yeah. So at Clara, we've been doing ZFS data recovery and helping people fix broken pools and so on for quite a while. So for Halloween this year, we're doing a special webinar that you can join live, and we're going to tell some scary Halloween stories of when people have almost lost all their data, but we managed to get it back. So join us October 31st at 1 o'clock Eastern, and you can listen to these stories live and ask questions. And if you do miss it, the video will be up on our website and YouTube after the fact. And you've also got an introduction to ZFS boot menu. Yes, uh, Jim wrote an excellent article introducing how to get started using ZFS boot menu to get the functionality FreeBSD has had for almost a decade now, but on Linux so that when you're using ZFS on Linux, you can get access to boot environments and be able to deal with whatever your package manager happens to throw as a monkey wrench into your configurations or whatever and have all the greatness that ZFS provides. Right, well, links in the show notes. Let's do some news. NIST proposes barring some of the most nonsensical password rules. It's about damn time. Now we just have to, you know, I would say hope, but we know better. We have to imagine in our fever dreams that organizations actually pay attention to those NIST rules and stop doing stupid things with their password validators. Yes, this is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's funny you say NIST. I always read it as NIST, but there we are. And of course, because this is a document that spells out requirements and so on, it uses specific terminology, such as, you know, so-and-so shall not means that you're not allowed to do it versus should and should not, which are, you probably shouldn't do this, but it's not really against the rules to do it the other way. The real big headline here is that passwords shall not impose other composition rules, like requiring a mixture of different character types for passwords. So requiring, you know, so many uppercase letters and some numbers and all that, that's verboten now. Your password can be whatever. It doesn't need to force you to put, you know, two symbols and an uppercase letter in it just because it's not actually adding a lot of value to your password. That's not the only great shell not. All the shell nots are awesome. Let me go ahead and work through the shell nots here. So after the one about, uh, you know, church signing up your password with letters and numbers, We have verifiers and CSPs shall not require users to change passwords periodically. However, verifiers shall force a change if there's evidence of compromise of the authenticator. Yay! Can we all stop and cheer super hard for that one? Yeah, the like changing your password every 30 or 90 days was proven to be negatively helpful two decades ago. And most places got away from it, but some places were still doing it. And hopefully this means that shall not means that they will stop making you change your password because we all know it doesn't help. And either you're using a strong password manager and generating a whole completely different password or you're most people and you're just changing a number or something at the end of your old password. And also, let's pay attention to the shall on the end of that. Shall force a change if there's evidence of compromise. That's also great. Not like hey, you know, we got compromised, you might want to think about it. (laughs) Not should force a change if they've been compromised, but like, no, if you've been compromised, you have to force your users to change their passwords, which I love that. So moving on to the next one. Verifiers and CSPs shall not permit the subscriber to store a hint that's accessible to an unauthenticated claimant. That's a good one. But moving on a little bit further... Verifiers and CSPs shall not prompt subscribers to use knowledge-based authentication, e.g. what was the name of your first pet. Thank you, thank you, InfoSec Jesus, for that one. I am so tired of picking three different random stupid questions and having to put in just sprays of random garbage for all three of them, because if you think that you might need to know the name of your first pet and the street you lived on when you were 12 and, I don't know, the city your mom was born in and whatever, uh, you need to do something better about your security practices. Like, that is just the widest road in to compromise of anything that, you know, these organizations are asking you to do to begin with. And it sucks. And it's just the worst part of, like, teaching your password manager to remember the fake answers you put to each of those questions so when they ask you them later, you will have the right one. I don't do that. I put in sprays of random garbage, and if they ever demand that from me, well, then things have already failed, and I'm already moving on from that account. (laughs) 
And then finally, verifiers shall verify the entire submitted password, i.e. not truncated. Now, this is one that a lot of people won't have noticed, but there are an awful lot of places out there that will let you type as long a password as you want and will ignore all but like the first eight or 12 or 16 characters of it. So this is another really good one I really like seeing. One of my banks was one of the ones that would just stop caring after the 12 characters. Yeah. And I remember discovering, I think it was eight characters, if anything that was hashed with triple desk back in the olden days, and if there's anything still using that, they should be lit on fire. But yeah, triple desk meant that you only had to get the first eight characters right, and everything else after that was just ignored. The shoulds are also good. I'm just a little salty that they're shoulds and not shells, because they really ought to be shells, in my opinion. Verifiers should permit a maximum password length of at least 64 characters. Look, 64 is already on the lightweight side. We could have just made that one a shall. I, I, I don't really have a whole lot of sympathy for anybody who's like, but my database size. Come on, man. It's 2024. Well, no, no. Uh, piss off. You're not, you shouldn't be storing the password in your database. If you're hashing it, it doesn't matter what size the input is. The hash is going to be the same size for every person, whether their password is 15 characters, 64 characters, or 264 characters. Having an upper limit to stop them using some kind of denial of service attack at, it, at you and like uploading a one megabyte password with every login request is sensible. And maybe that's 256 characters or 1024 characters or something. But... If you're storing the original length of the password in your database, you're doing it wrong and you shall not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent catch, Alan. My bad. The one I argue with a little bit is they, you know, when I first read it, I was like, what? Verifiers and CSPs shall require the password be a minimum of eight characters. I'm like, that is not long enough. But then it goes on and should require the password to be a minimum of 15 characters. Which, again, like I said, my only real complaint about the shoulds is the shoulds should all have been shalls as well. And then the final should, uh, verifiers and CSPs should accept Unicode characters and passwords. Each Unicode point shall be counted as a single character when evaluating length. And verifiers and CSPs should accept all printing ASCII characters and the space character and passwords. And again, yes, absolutely. Don't try to shield yourself from a semicolon by saying you can't have it in the password. Just sanitize your freaking inputs, people. But if you're hashing it, it doesn't matter what characters they put in the password. It comes out as like base64 in the database with no special characters at all. It'll be fine. Just do it properly. Every programming language includes the functions to do password hashing for you because we don't trust you to do it right yourself. So just use the existing key derivation functions. But the real question here is, is anyone actually going to take any notice of NIST here? Somewhat. And, you know, if this ends up going into things like we've talked about before, like the U.S. cyber trust mark and so on, we might actually see that in order to get the stamp on your product, you have to follow these rules. And I think that's the only way anybody's really going to care is if there, there becomes a branding that's associated with this. And in order to achieve the branding, you have to comply with the rules. Then I think, yes, people will comply with the branding because it, it'll be like, you remember the rush to get the green lock icon, you know, from the HTTPS when HTTPS first really started becoming a thing. Banks even would like fret over whether they got the good lock icon or the bad lock icon. I think once there's an icon that says you did the things and your crap is secure, whether that bears any relation to reality or not, I do think that organizations will absolutely chase that branding. So if we tie the branding to sensible recommendations, I think we'll be in a good place. The only issue is that this is arriving just in time for a lot of things to move away from passwords and move to the things like the pass keys and, and other stuff that Google and those are pushing for. But at least we finally got here. You're right not to rush into running AMD or Intel's new many-core monster CPUs. This is an opinion piece on the register by Simon Sharwood. Yeah, and I think it's a little misguided. He does have some points. It's not just entire bunk, but I feel like he's got a very limited perspective there. Essentially, he's saying that very few people will actually make use of all the cores in massively multi-core servers, and that even if they do, it ups the stakes because the only way typically to get good use out of all those cores is to load a lot more work on an individual server, which in turn means you have a, you know, you've got a lot more omelet lying on the floor if you tip over the basket, right? But 
I kind of wonder how much experience he's really got in the space. Because in my experience, the people who are buying massively multi-core servers, they know exactly why they're buying them. I mean, they cost so much that you're not usually buying something like that on a whim. You have a good idea of how many cores you need and how much RAM you need for the workload that you've got. And if you've got the workload to justify a 128 core server with a boatload of RAM in it, guess what? It's going to run much, much more performantly on a single server than it would distributed over a bunch of servers or in a multi-socketed server that is going to have, you know, bigger NUMA issues than a single socket. So speaking personally as somebody who has deployed a lot of massively multi-core servers, I'm like, no, man, bring on the, you know, tremendous numbers of cores in a single socket. It's the best way to go. Even just ecologically, a couple of these, you know, 128 or 192 core servers running what would have been, you know, a whole rack full of servers, maybe running them as VMs, because, you know, maybe you are going to struggle to use all 128 cores in one configuration of workload. But if you divide 128 cores into a bunch of 16 core VMs, then you can very quickly use up all 128 cores or even oversubscribe some of them if you really need to. And if you're running four machines instead of 16 or 24 machines in a rack, then there's that much less power being wasted on power supplies and conversions and fans and the total power utilization factor gets to a much better number and you're getting that same amount of work done for that much less electricity and that much less cooling and that much less everything. And even just the fragmentation problem. If you have... 16 servers that each have 128 gigs of RAM, and you're condensing that down to fewer servers that each have like two terabytes of RAM. If you need a bit more RAM, it's easy to get it from one big pool instead of having it distributed across a bunch of separate machines. It's kind of the same idea that you, the backing behind ZFS was if we took all the disks and made one big pool, then we can take a bunch of different workloads on top of it and they can use the resources as they need. And we can do the same thing with CPUs and RAM by having big pools of resources and then partitioning them up across a bunch of machines, whereas if they're physically partitioned into separate machines, we don't have that same flexibility. It kind of feels like somebody arguing against virtualization in like the early 2000s saying, oh, you don't want to load up all those functions on one single physical box because then what if the box dies? Like all your stuff went down. And yet it turns out the whole freaking industry absolutely loves being able to decouple the sense of separate workloads as defined by operating systems and applications and whatever from the physical hardware. Because even with the hardware of the 2000s, we already so frequently had in a single box so much more firepower than we needed for any one individual application or workload that we were running. So it made a lot of sense to be able to condense that and be able to run multiple workloads on the same hardware and use it more efficiently. This is just more of the same. Now, there are some workloads that don't suit themselves all that well with this approach. Like if you've got a specialty workload that is extremely heavy on memory bandwidth and not that heavy on uh, you know CPU cores, this is probably not going to be the best solution for you because you're going to want the individual memory bandwidth allocations that you get from individual machines. It would suck for you to condense 16 workloads onto one box if the memory bandwidth doesn't go up, which it won't. But that's not the constraint most folks have. Most folks are constrained, first of all, on the number and uh, performance level of the cores they have to work with, and second of all, on the total amount of RAM they can cram in the box, not by the total amount of memory bandwidth. Yeah, like to the point where VMware has a product that is, let's use NVMe as a second layer of RAM because when we have all these VMs running, some amount of the RAM we give to each VM is actually not being properly used. And if we could swap it out to something fast like NVMe, we could make that much more utilization out of the RAM that we have. Not saying that's a good idea, but there's enough of a market for it that people are always like, we need more RAM. And having all the RAM in one place makes it a lot easier to dole it out than having it spread across a large number of machines. He makes a point that if you've got a monster machine like this, then your hot spare is going to have to also be a monster. And that it's hard to justify to the people writing the checks that you're going to build two of these hugely expensive servers. Except that's a really stupid take, because if you had eight smaller servers instead, then you'd need eight hot spares to go with them, and you'll have spent far more building those 16 smaller machines than you would have spent building 
two larger ones. Well, he makes the point that the temptation is to build a smaller hot spare that's not quite as beefy as your production. You could make the same argument about any size machine. I mean, this is just basically, oh, hey, sometimes the bean counters make stupid decisions if you don't you know, keep hold of them. But they already do that. This doesn't make that any worse. Either you have control of your environment or you don't. If you let the bean counters who know nothing about the tech call the shots, you're going to have a bad time. Whether or not you've got massively multi-core systems, because either way, they're going to cheap out, not understand what they're doing and cause you problems. This does not change that in either direction. The trend I've seen more lately is instead of having, you know, one busy server and one idle server, you split the workload so each server is under 50% utilized. And if one of them fails, the load moves over and we have one server that's very busy. But there's no sense having the one server sit in there idle when it could be doing half the work and giving you that much more headroom. And it's much easier to justify a server that's 45% busy with actual work and 50% reserved to take over the work from another machine than it is to have a machine that's literally sitting entirely empty. It also avoids the temptation of the, the DR machine getting a bunch of test stuff on it and being not in the right configuration for when a failover does need to happen. See, personally, I disagree with that. I do like the uh, the idle hot spare system. That's that's what I prefer. And I do get customers fairly frequently asking, well, you know, why don't we just run half the workload on this one and half the workload on that one? And they generally like my answer, which is that, you know, yes, you could do that, but it won't make your life particularly better day to day. And it will make life a lot more difficult if one of those machines fails and we need to pull just like a portion of stuff over and now you're running twice the workload on half the box and everything's different and it sucks as opposed to like, look, you get the idle hot spare and it's very, very easy to just push button, promote to production and everything runs the exact same way and just as fast as it did before. Uh, my preference is if people want to be, you know, bean counters on this and they don't want to spend the money on having, you know, exactly identical hardware for the hot spare, then in that case, my preferred approach is still to have the idle hot spare, but just say, okay, well, what we do is, you know, we run the production machine for X number of years, and then that gets demoted to hot spare, and the old hot spare gets deprecated, and the newer, faster box becomes the new production. In which case, you do still have the issue of like, okay, things might be a little slower if we have to fail over to the hot spare, but it's still easy and predictable. You're not doing like junkyard science. You're just pushing a button to make it happen. Right. And I think I also, there's a couple other things that yours has the advantage of. One being, if you split the workload, you might not realize that you're actually hitting the limitation of your IOPS. And when you have to combine both halves into one, that machine's going to then struggle with something that it didn't see when it were separate. Whereas if it's all on one box and it all transitions over to an identical box, then you know the performance should be the same between them rather than being like, oh, we're now getting some contention over some resource that was split before. And also, I imagine as far as saving power, a completely idle machine can go into a much lower power state. But if both machines are 50% used, they're not going to save much power versus being 100% used. So having one machine running closer to max and one completely idle is likely going to save you some electricity. I don't know if it's going to be enough to make a big difference, but it probably does make a difference. I'd also have to say the IOPS constraints you mentioned, you know, if you're condensing the workloads from two machines that are theoretically running half of what the office does, you know, and one of them fails and you have to get it all in one. Yeah, the IOPS constraints are definitely going to be an issue. And that's going to be the reason why even in the best of cases, like you're going to have a noticeable slowdown when you do that. But that's kind of a best case problem, in my opinion. The more common one is that when you've got it split up like that, you wind up with somebody just keeps adding workload until both machines are well over 50% and you no longer can spin up all those VMs at once on one because you've gone over 50% RAM and you just, you can't get everything going on one box. Can you store it all? Probably. Can you actually operate it in production? Nope. Okay, this episode is sponsored by people who support us with PayPal and Patreon. Go to 2.5admins.com slash support for details of how you can support us too. Patreon supporters have the option to listen to episodes without ads like this. And it's not just this show. There's Late Night Linux for news, discoveries, audience input, and misanthropy. Linux Matters for upbeat family-friendly adventures. Linux After Dark for silly challenges and philosophical debates. Linux Dev Time about developing with and for Linux. Hybrid Cloud Show for everything public and private cloud and ask the hosts for off-topic questions from you. You can even get some episodes a bit early. 
We've got a lot going on, and it's only possible because of the people who support us. So if you like what we do and can afford it, it would be great if you could support us too at 2.5admins.com slash support. The Disappearance of an Internet Domain This is a piece by Gareth Edwards. Now what this is about is the .io domain, which the IO stands for Indian Ocean because it was the British Indian Ocean Territory, also known as the Chagos Islands, which recently the UK gave back slash gave to Mauritius. Now that's a whole political hot potato that we're not going to get into. But the fact remains that the British Indian Ocean Territory will soon no longer exist. And so Gareth is arguing that the .io will cease to exist, which will cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. And which I would argue there's just no way that's going to happen. .io has become such a popular TLD that even if IANA made absolutely no effort to deal with this situation and just said, nope, we're going to kill off .io as a top-level domain because that territory doesn't exist anymore and that was a territory domain, I think the obvious thing that would happen is some private entity would simply register it as a private .tld, drop the, what is it, 200K to register? I mean, it would not be hard to make your $200,000 back just telling everybody out there with a .io domain, okay, this is what renewals cost this year. I don't think that's as likely to happen. You know, there's no rule that says IANA is going to stop allowing registrations of .io, like the article says. In fact, IANA doesn't actually get to decide that. The, the domain stuff is mostly delegated to ICANN. And I think most importantly, the new government of Mauritius is going to want to keep making money off this. And why would they refuse to make money off .io even if they get their own new TLD that they can also sell? They might as well be getting royalties off .io. Well, the theoretical issue here is that once the British Indian Ocean Territory cease to exist as a political organization, they'll no longer be listed as such by the ISO, which in turn means that IANA won't automatically have a top-level domain for that based on that fact. But this assumes that IANA won't simply say, all right, well, that's a problem, but it just won't be a country domain anymore. This will now be a public TLD like .com or .net or, you know, any of the rest. The thing that I was saying about some private organization would just register it as a private TLD, that's like your worst case fall through scenario. Now, Alan's comment about the country of Mauritius wanting to keep that revenue, that just strongly implies that Mauritius itself would be the ones to be like their governor, just be like, here's $200,000. Thank you very much. Go away. And, you know, this isn't the first time that this particular problem has come up. There is the .su top level domain for the former Soviet Union. The .su domain was created in mid-1990, about 15 months before the Soviet Union ceased to be a political entity anymore. And that TLD is still out there. It's run by the Russian Institute for Public Networks, and you have to have a Russian passport to register a domain or whatever. But it is still there and still resolves and works. And that country hasn't existed since 1991. I just did a dig NSSU and uh, I immediately got back A, B, D, E, and F dot DNS dot R, A, P, N dot net. No word on what happened to C. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do some free consulting then. But first, just a quick thank you to everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. And if you want to send in your questions for Jim and Alan or your feedback, you can email show at 2.5admins.com. Jim writes, No relation. I've heard you talk a few times about different router options. I've done the OpenSense DIY router build, but what about a Linux equivalent? I did a little searching and found a few projects, but nothing with the same support as OpenSense or PFSense. Then I got to thinking, what about taking a mini PC with two NICs and installing Linux on it, then Pi-hole with Unbound, using that as a router with its built-in DNS and DHCP? It has a nice web interface, and you can still SSH in like any Linux box and do some things with the terminal. It would be a nice, easy setup for a home or small office. What are your thoughts? Well, the big thought is it's actually not going to be an easy setup for a home or small office because if you install Unbound and Pi-hole, you get a DNS resolver and you optionally get a DHCP server, but neither project does anything about the rest of what you need to be a router. They don't offer a firewall, they don't offer network address translation, and they don't offer a web interface for administering any of those things. So you're still going to be doing most of the work of it being a router from the command line in plain text files. Now, with that said, 
if you just wanted to use Pi-hole as your DNS server and uh, Unbound as your DHCP server, that's fine. It just, it's not going to make the result a whole lot easier either to set up or to maintain than doing the same thing with Bind and with ISC DHCP server, which is what I do. Dare I bring up OpenWRT or OpenWRT, as some people call it? You absolutely dare. That is a project that it's used to great effect in a lot of products, but there's typically a lot more involved in productizing it than just installing OpenWRT on a box and being done with it. OpenWRT does offer an optional built-in web interface called Lucy, and it really kind of sucks rocks. Some people will be okay with just using Lucy as an interface, and to those folks, that, that's fine. The other thing that I would point out is that when I have tested OpenWRT on x86, it has not done really well. It offers a ton of maximum throughput under the best conditions, but it's kind of peaky and weird compared to just doing your routing in the Linux kernel itself on just, you know, a, a standard like vanilla Ubuntu or whatever. That's why I don't use OpenWRT. And Alan wouldn't dream of using a Linux-based router. Well, mostly just because I'm not that familiar with how to do all the NAT and all that stuff on Linux, and I can do it literally with my eyes closed on BSD, but that's just having to do with my experience. I think the biggest thing is like, yes, PyHole provides you a bit of a web interface, but it's not really going to fill all the nooks and crannies that something like OpenSense or WRT or whatever did. So if you want to do it yourself, that's fine. But realize that you're getting yourself in quite a bit deeper than you might expect. And if you want to learn all that stuff and want to put it all together yourself, it's a great way to learn all that stuff. But if you just want your internet to work and you have, you know, spousal approval factor of flying into this, you might decide to stick with something a little more out of the box. Moving back to Joe's open word idea, I think that if you're really interested in open word, I don't think the x86 box is the best angle to use for that. I frankly don't get the impression that those builds get quite as much love and attention as the uh, the ARM builds. And you can easily buy commercial products that you can reflash with bone stock open work if that's what you want to do. TP-Link particularly, and here's me plugging TP-Link again, but they have like a whole wiki dedicated to letting you know which models of their hardware are directly compatible with vanilla open work and even giving you instructions on how to reflash them. So if that's the angle you're looking for, like you want open work, you just want to have the nice open source project that does all your stuff and gives you at least somewhat of a web interface to manage it with, I think it probably makes more sense just to buy a cheap router and reflash it rather than to go x86. Yeah, like going with something that does open work means that it's going to use less power than mini PC. It's going to be less expensive because it only has exactly the parts you need, not a whole computer. And the WRT and OpenWRT comes from those old Linksys routers that were the first ones you could do that to. But now you have a much wider selection of much better router devices that you can get nice open source Linux-based software on and have all the control and stuff that you want and the ability to SSH into it, but without having to go and build it all yourself like you would with a mini PC. I'm pretty sure you can install OpenWRT on the EAP225 access points that we've all got, but I don't suppose you'd want to use one of them as a router, would you? Not as a router, no. Now, I, I have absolutely seen people uh, reflashing those specific access points uh, with OpenWRT. To be honest, with somewhat dubious results, uh, the last time I saw it done at scale, there was an attempt to uh, run all of the networking for the uh, Southeast Linux Fest convention with OpenWRT running on uh, access points. Now, they weren't all identical access points. It was like two or three trash bags worth of whatever could be reflashed, and it didn't work out very well. I'm not sure how much of that is the fault of OpenWRT versus, you know, the fault of grab bags worth of random crap that could be reflashed with open work. But either way, I, I don't know that I would advise that. In a smaller scale, it's certainly worth a shot. But if what you want is, you know, a router running open work as opposed to the access points, and keep in mind, either or both can run open work. Again, I would probably recommend TP-Link. I would recommend looking, uh, if you want the cheaper stuff, look at their Archer line of routers, uh, generally going to be under $100 and have support for being reflashed with open work. They do have more expensive stuff beyond that if you think you might need more firepower than the Archer series can bring to bear. Right, well, we better get out of here then. Remember, show at 2.5admins.com if you want to send any questions or your feedback. You can find me at joerest.com slash mastodon. You can find me at mercenarysysadmin.com. 
And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you next week.